From Gravit, Arkansas, this is Shepherd's Chapel with Pastor Arnold Murray. Join with us now as Pastor Murray takes you on a book by book, chapter by chapter, line by line, study in God's Word. Now, here's Pastor Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Hey, welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get into our Father's Word. Guess what we're going to do? Remember Deborah and J.L. from the last lecture? Today we're going into a song. Because I want to take that song and I want to show you what was really going on. What was really going on? Our Father was in control. He's in control today. He has always been in control. But he will only communicate with those that communicate with him first in his word. He doesn't have really anything to say to you until after you absorb basically at least his general plan. Then he will speak to you. Many people say, well, how do I get God to talk to me? Right here. He talked to you through, he wrote you this letter giving you instructions on exactly what to do. And... Many people say, well, I just wish I knew. It's really simple. A child can understand it. Therefore, we will use that method. I'll even use that analogy of teaching this fifth chapter whereby a child could understand it. It's Deborah singing about the praises of God, for it was God that took this woman when no man, no man would stand up against the enemy. This woman stood and God used her as well as another woman, to actually destroy the enemy. So, you see, how did he do it? You couldn't find out. We ask a word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua's name. Chapter 5, the great book of Judges, and that woman of women, a woman of Israel, Deborah, the author, along with Baruch, of the song. Let's go with it. Uh, chapter 5, verse 1, and it reads, Then sang Deborah and Baruch, the son of Abinoam, on that day, saying... Now listen, listen carefully. Do you know what a song does? A song uh, seals the emotions of an event that has transpired, in this case, giving praise to God and thanks for the deliverance from a very cruel taskmaster master and enemy. Okay, so that, therefore you're going to get your explanation. Verse 2, praise, this is the subject, praise ye the Lord for the avenging of Israel. Or you, I, I would rather translate it, and it will stand it, the, praise the, ye the Lord for the leading of uh, Israel. For he was the leader, he's the one that brought about the victory. When the people willingly very important word for the people when the people willingly offered themselves how God loves willingness and it seems like that most after the battle is over are willing to worship God when the enemy is destroyed but as you're going to find in this song there were many of the children that wanted no part of it that is to say the endangerment verse 3 Hear, O ye kings, give ear, O ye princes. I, who's I? Deborah, even I will sing unto the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. And what does she want? Two times for emphasis. That give God the glory. When God performs a miracle in your life, you need to thank Him for it immediately. The next time you're alone, especially in talking with him, thank him for it. It makes his day. Uh, well, let, me, let me ask you a question. If you ever do something real nice that you, you had to go out of your way, did something real nice for someone and they just kind of said, when will you do that again? Or maybe the next day they'll say, you're late. How does that make you feel? Hmm? Naturally, you would rather they said, thank you very much. I appreciated that. I was down and I needed someone to lift me up. Naturally, that's what God wants. It, it makes his day when you thank him for having helped you up. Verse 4. Lord, 
When thou wentest out of Seir, we're going back in history now. When thou marchest out of the field of Edom, the earth trembled, and the heavens dropped the clouds, also dropped water. Remember where Edom is. That's the fields of Rush. That's the land of Esau. And God watches over it for you. That is to say, anything that is socialistic, God will keep away from a people that fight enough to keep it away from them, that are willing to take a stand. Socialism and communism have proved to be a ruination of nations. And there have been many brave soldiers in this nation that have fought against that taskmaster master known as communism or socialism on this earth. And then sometimes we even allow someone to slip in the back door and try to foster socialistic system off on this great free nation. Wake up, friend. Stand up and be counted. God walked through Edom. You know, you know what Edom means in the, in the Hebrew tongue? Red. And he put down the red curtain, the iron curtain, so to speak. And many, many of the troops of this great nation and the, the, uh, the uh, Korean and the South Vietnamese uh, conflict, the Vietnamese conflict, broke the back of communism and are the people of this nation proud of them? Most of them are ignorant of what they even accomplished. You'd better be proud of them, for God used mighty men and women to keep this nation free to enjoy and free to praise God for His many blessings. Verse 5, The mountains melted from before the Lord. They quake, they shake, and when the torrents come down, the topsoil melts away as well. And, and mountains also means nations. They quake at his, his approach if they are evil. Even that Sinai for, from before the Lord God of Israel, he takes whomever, whatever, and whenever he chooses. He is Yahweh, the living God. Verse 6. In the days of Shamgar, remember him, the third judge, and the word meaning sword, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, and here we have a conjunction between Shamgar and Jael, Jael being that woman that would kill Sisera, the head of a nation, and that nation fell and melted before God through the hand of Jael, as well as Shamgar. God uses people, but God is the accomplisher. The highways were unoccupied, and the travelers walked through byways, or they walked crooked ways. They hid. They hid themselves. They were afraid. And then a woman like J.L. comes along, a woman like Deborah, a man like Barak. People make a difference when God is leading them. In other words, everybody was afraid of everything. Look around your cities today. You go out and take a nice little stroll in the evening? Hmm? Verse 7. The inhabitants of the villages ceased. They ceased in Israel until I, Deborah, arose. That I arose a mother in Israel. And what a woman. Now, you know, she was a prophet. She was a teacher. And a lot of men today will say... They, they have listened to this dogmatic, ignorant teachings that are brought out by the so-called pastors, and they need to be pastorized a little bit themselves, a little work in God's Word, just, just out winning a few friends here and influencing people. Go according to God's Word, please Him, and don't care too much what self-righteous hypocrites teach or say. All right? Deborah stood when the long-robed pulpit fillers snuck around the byways, scared to death. All right? Verse 8. They chose new gods. They found an easier way to get around it. Then was war in the gates 
Was there a shield or a spear seen among 40,000 in Israel? They wouldn't have picked a weapon up for anything. They wouldn't have made a stand against that that is evil. Well, it's just the way of the times. Make a difference, my friend. Deborah did. And if the pulpits of this nation do not stand up, that is to say the men and women that fill them, and start making a difference, it is God that makes the difference. He, as, as we learned, God allowed the enemy to remain among us to teach us how to war against the enemy, the spiritual battle that goes on to this day. And quite frankly, some are losing. I can see it. They're losing. Losing the war. Why? They won't fight because they don't know that it is God that gives us the victory. It's what goes on above our heads that make the difference. Slipping and slipping around and afraid to pick up a weapon to put on the gospel armor in this generation and use it. Well, you mean actually use a sword? The sword is the word. Use the word of God to wake people up and to give them something worthwhile. That is to say, the comfort of their true father. That he's there all the time and wishes to help them. Men, women, and children. Listen. Verse 9. My heart is toward the governors of Israel. They offered themselves willingly among the people. Bless ye the Lord. Sometimes they will. 10. Speak ye that ride on white asses. This was a, this was a sign of royalty or, gov- or in a position. Ye that sit in judgment and walk by the way. What way? The way of the judges, the rulers, those that are supposed to make a difference, especially those of the church. If a church isn't salty and everything that it touches is left a little saltier, then it's not a church of God. God's not in it. In other words, true Christians make a difference because they, yield, they wield the sword of the Lord, which is to say His Word, and that Word cuts, corrects, reshapes, molds hearts, minds, souls. Back to the loving way of their Father. Verse 11. They that are delivered from the noise of archers in the places of drawing water, there shall they rehearse the righteous acts of the Lord. I said, of the Lord. God said, of the Lord. Deborah saying of the Lord, He it is that gives us our strength. Even the righteous acts toward the inhabitants of His village in Israel, then shall the people of the Lord go down to the gates. The the gates is where the judgment took place. God Himself will protect that you when you go out to draw water, usually we didn't they didn't have faucets in your kitchen like we do today, but Everyone had to go draw their water from a common place, and the archers of the enemy would pick them off. Uh, God takes care of that if you're armed properly with the gospel armor. Verse 12. Awake, awake, Deborah. Awake, awake, utter a song. Arise, Barak. And lead thy captivity captive, thy, thou son of Abinoam. And so it is today. Do you realize that when you plant a seed, who do you want to be held captive? First, let's take it from this angle. Who do you wish to be held captive by in this generation? I hope the King of Kings. I hope that you wish to be held captive by the Lord Jesus Christ, his love, his the shining presence and spirit, the Holy Spirit, awake to it. Wake up. Look around you. Don't be afraid. You don't have to be. As long as you use common sense. It's real strange that I would say this when on national news this very day a burglar broke into a house. Uh, I believe it was here in Arkansas. And the woman that he broke in on fell to her knees and began to pray and told the burglar, I'm going to pray for you. And apparently he needed it. Well, what he did was a surprise to most of the world. 
he fell down on his knees and began to pray and asking her forgiveness and gave back everything he had taken from her, emptied his gun out. That is to say, I don't mean by firing it, but the bullets and left his gun there and left. Apparently a changed man. You see, I, now I'm not, um, I would say the same thing. If you don't have a lot of faith, I wouldn't necessarily advise you, depending on that, to be your protection. But I use that illustration because perhaps it happened this very day, the day we would be teaching this, to still emphasize that the Word is a powerful sword. In this case, it was more powerful than the revolver. For it brought down this man and changed him. Will it remain that way? I know not. But be that as it may, he was taken captive by the Lord Jesus Christ. And God changes people when they come into his captivity. You can be taken captive by Satan, his evilness and the ways of this world. What it is, what is he saying here? Then stand up and with the word of God, take people captive, change their lives. Verse 13. Then he made him, let me tell you who him is, it's Barak, uh, that remaineth, uh, that remaineth, uh, have dominion over the nobles, that's to say the mighty, among the people. The Lord, who did this? The Lord made me. Who is me? Deborah. The Lord made me, Deborah, have dominion over the mighty. God gives power to those he chooses, those that will take a stand, those that will make a difference. Well, I, just, I really don't know what the religious community might think of me if I took a stand. Well, th then... You'll never serve God if you worry about what the religious community crucified Christ. It's a good thing he didn't pay too much attention to them. You don't have to worry about what the religious community thinks. The majority of it has already gone sour, or this world would not be in the condition it is today. And you have God's Word, which is your governor that tells you that that is right from that that is wrong. Stick with it and don't worry too much about what men will say or think. It doesn't matter as long as you please the Father and receive His blessings, okay? The Lord leads and drives those whom He chooses or those who, the key word, willingly, willingly serve Him. You even take over the mighty and influence them whether you realize it or not. Wherever that word is taught, wherever that sword is drawn, that is the word of God, it touches hearts and minds of men, women, and children, and changes and molds, yes, even the mighty. Verse 14, Out of Ephraim was there a root of them against Amalek. After thee, Benjamin... Among thy people, out of Makar, Makar, come down governors, um, came down governors, rather, and out of Zebulun, they that handled the pen of the rider. That is to say, uh, a pen of a rider, not in the sense of writing scripture, but mustering the children of God. Who is this uh, Makar? He was the son of Manassas. This is Ephraim and Manassas, thought by many scholars, and in this one included, being Great Britain and America, even today, and those satellite nations that belong to the free world. Uh, God used them then. But note, it indicates a root, just a few. And just a few mighty men and women and children is all it takes, my friend. A small family shall become the entire nation of God with the king of kings at the reins. That is very biblical from the book of Isaiah, verse 15. And the princes of Issachar were with Deborah. Well, they didn't slack off. They were there. Even Issachar and also Baruch. 
He was sent on foot into the valley, yeah, with nine hundred chariots with flashing swords at the hub of each wheel. For the divisions of Reuben, there were, there, there were great thoughts of heart. You know what this says? Their divisions means their properties, and they were divided in thought, for one thing. They didn't want to go. They stayed where they were safe. But not Ishakar and Zebulun. 16. Why abodest thou among the sheepfolds? What are you doing holding back out there playing a sheep herder today? To hear the bleedings of the flock? Deborah could have said, you're scared, because that's exactly what it was. They would not make a stand. For the divisions of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. They fell by the wayside, and their own little possessions seemed greater to them, and they were more comfortable with them. Why take a chance? Why rock the boat? It's just the way things are. Things are the way they are because we have allowed them to become as they are. And thank our Heavenly Father, we're beginning to make a difference in this generation because the wrath of God is hot. He's tired of it, and His wrath is boiling to that day that it will spew over. Where will you be? Verse 17. Gilad abode beyond Jordan. You know what abode means? He stayed there. And why did Dan remain in ships? He didn't come and help. Asher continued on the seashore and abode. That is to say, he stayed in his breaches. He stayed there in his little creeks and places of safety. He would not lift a hand. And this woman, Deborah, had to make this stand. And boy, Deborah meaning bee in the Hebrew tongue. And don't you ever call her anything but queen bee. Verse 18, Zebulun and Naphtali were a people that jeopard. An old word we don't use too much anymore, but just insert that jeopardized their lives unto the death in the high places of the field. They were brave. They didn't mind putting themselves in a little danger. But let me tell you something, beloved. Get this into your mind. You don't have to worry about a little danger when God is giving you the blessings. He's always there. He took care of the chariots. The men didn't. God took care of the danger Himself. That's what I'm saying. And then it was like destroying insects. Verse 19, that is to say, when they lost their main method of warring, God did the warring for us. You got it? How brave, what kind of a bravery does it take to go to battle when you know God's going to fight it for you? 19. The kings came and fought. Then fought the kings of Canaan in Teanach. By the waters of Megiddo, they took no gain of money. Do you, do you understand what's being said here? You see, there's prophecy in this song. Do you know what Megiddo is? Have you ever heard of Armageddon? This is where it takes place, friend. Only two battles written, Haman Gog, Armageddon. What does Megiddo mean then? Megiddo means the gathering place of the crowd. What crowd? Satan as the false messiah and his troops. Are you going to be afraid of them? Or are you going to let God lead you and be a champion of your people? Stand up. Wake up. We're coming into that generation. And we don't have a thing to worry about because we have the victory all the way. Now, we don't have to worry about Megiddo which is to say Armageddon, because God fights the battle himself as it is written. We have a little work to do between now and then. So wake up. Roll call, as it was written in verse 14. Muster time, friend. Where are you going to be? Do you want to take a stand? Do you want to be active in a ministry that God blesses? Or do you just want to let it all roll by? And wake up someday and be naked, as far as righteous acts are concerned, before the Lord God Himself. Wake up. It's happening now. 20. <clears throat> do you know how they had the victory? And do you know how we're going to have it at Armageddon? And I could document this from many places. Wake up. 
from God's Word you learn. This is how it happens. Verse 20. They fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. Now, wait just a minute. That's probably just a figure of speech. No, Sisera. A flesh man, the enemy of God's children at this time. The very heavens themselves fought. Stars are the sons of God, angelic beings. Fought against Sisera. Brought the, the um, floods that sunk his little chariots all the way to the axle and his horses all the way to their belly, whereby the flashing swords on the wheels of the chariots were no danger because they were stuck in the mud. God destroyed them with the very soothing approach and at nature itself, His creation. God takes care of His own. I never, when I come to this place, I can, my mind always races and remembers what Elisha said to his armor bearer when they climbed this mountain. Elisha, is that right? Yes. And they looked over and there were thousands of troops just on the other side of the mountain. Their enemy, even worse than this Sisera. And the sword bearer was very loyal and he was ready to die. He was frightened. And Elisha said, God, if you could, if you could, just part the veil a little bit that he can see this army over our heads. And God heard that prayer and he did. And the armor bearer saw thousands of angelic mighty warriors just overhead that made such a sound that the enemy killed themselves trying to get away. You see, if that veil were rent today, my friend, trust me, trust your father. You wouldn't be so afraid to make a stand because you would know you were making a stand on the right. Yes, even the heavenly bodies conquered Sisera that day, and as you will read in as you will read in the great book of Revelations and even in the book of Ezekiel in chapter 39, the first 8 verses of the chapter that it is God that fights our enemy. It is God that gives us the victory always. Verse 21. The river how, how did the angelic beings accomplish this? The river of Kishon swept them away. A flood. That ancient river, the river Kishon, oh my soul, thou hast trodden down strength uh, or soul. The, that spiritual part of my body marches on in strength. Uh, why doesn't it? In might. Because of the help that God gives us. Many might say, well, boy, I have trouble believing that. Well, if you've ever been in combat a great deal, you would not be if you were fighting in a Christian army. Verse 22. Then were the horse hooves broken by the means of the prancings, the prancings of their mighty ones. This really loses it in the translation. If you have a Moffat Bible, and hopefully we're going to bring it back into print, I don't know, but... If you have one, and many of you do, this song is so beautiful that it, as the strobes are set forth. But it says it didn't mean prancing. You think of a parade horse. This is their prancing in flight and trying to get away. Get away from what? From the power of God. 23. Listen carefully. Curse ye me, Ross said the angel of the Lord. That's the Lord himself saying, Curse you, refuge, your place of safety. Curse ye bitterly the inhabitants thereof, because they came not to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. What are you doing, friend? God says, Curse those that do not help me. Meaning God speaking. That help him what? That help him give us the victory or those that will make a stand. When God puts a curse on someone, yeah, they're well cursed. 
I do not say that to intimidate or to frighten. It is a fact. It is recorded in this song. And that's, what, what would you do if you had children? Would you reward them with those that cared and loved you and worked at bringing about his purpose? What would you do to those that were sluggards, that held back, were cowards, that never raised a hand and could care less about you? I can tell you, you'd curse them and care less about them. You make your own bed, and the bed you make, you sleep in, and don't blame God, Satan, or anyone else for it. What are you going to do? You make the choice. Verse 24. Instead of cursing, you always want a blessing, beloved. Listen, the example is set forth. Blessed above women shall Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, be. Blessed shall she be above women in the tent. Why? She made a difference. Now, you know, and I don't want to go into explaining, Heber was not a Kenite. He only lived in the land of the Kenites, and was, it's a geographical identification or identifier. It's better to be blessed by our Father than to be cursed by Him. Well, I've always wondered why I felt like I was cursed. Well, maybe you're finding out. It's your fault if you are. I tell you this, it's much more pleasant to have his blessings than his cursings. 25. We're back to Sisera and we're back to J.L., okay? 25. He asked water. And she gave him milk. She brought forth butter in a lardly dish. In other words, it was buttermilk. She brought it forth. Here, cool yourself, Sisera. Come into my parlor, said the spider to the fly. And, and I only use that to show you how she deceived him to a point that she could kill him. God leading her. This is a blessed woman we're talking about. 26. She put her hand to the nail. And her right hand to the workman's hammer, a big one. And with the hammer, she smote Sisera. She smote off his head. The off should be through. She smote him through the head when she had pierced and stricken through his temples. She nailed him to the tent floor. Blessed is this woman. Why? She destroyed the enemy of God's children, and it was God that gave her the power. You think there wasn't someone just over her head to make certain? 27. At her feet he bowed, and he fell. He lay down. At her feet he bowed. This is a king. He fell. Where he bowed, there he fell down, dead, destroyed. At the hand of a woman, a mighty woman, a woman serving the living God, the wife of a Midianite priest, son of Abraham, by Keturah. And there you have it. God cursed those that were inactive, didn't care. Just don't shake the boat. Maybe they won't notice us. Curse them. But blessings to those that even say a prayer, for those that dare take a stand, that dare to make a difference, that dare to be a champion of the living God. Some of you have known there was more to God's Word since you were a child than you've been taught by a lot of one-verse Charlies. And it's time you made that stand. You think about it. Let Him know, for it is from He that all power comes. You know what happened in the other camp? Poor old Sisera, nailed to the floor, little old damsel there, all right. Now, this is what his mother said, verse 28. The mother of Sisera looked out at a, at a window and cried through the lattice, Why is his chariot so long in coming? Question. Why tarry the wheels of his chariots? They're kind of muddy. <laughs> kind of muddy, and poor old Cicero is having the time of his life, all right? 29. 
Her wise ladies answered her, yea, she returned answer to herself. The ladies saying, he's just having a good time. Don't worry about it, Mama. He'll be home soon. Verse 30. She took their comfort, but went back to her place as only a mother can worry. Verse 30. Have they not sped? They weren't in a hurry. That's what she's saying. Have they not divided the prey? They really made a killing on this battle. To every man a damsel or two. To Sisera a prey of divers colors, a prey of divers colors of needlework, of divers colors of needlework on both sides. Meet for the necks of them that take the spoil. He, he had the embroidered needlework, all right. She put it right over him, covered him up well. He had a couple of damsels, Deborah and J.L., and he was enjoying himself quite well, all right. He got the spike right between his temple, right through the temple, nailed to the ground. Many people say, why is it that the bad ones always win? Friend, they don't. They only think they are. And you only think they are if you do not walk in the power of God. Yeah, he's divided the spoil, all right. And yeah, he's having a great time because somebody dared make a difference and allowed God to lead them. Her name was J.L. She was a woman and she did more for God's work than any man of that day. All the men were trying to kill Sisera. This daughter of God destroyed the enemy. The honor went to, went to her, not even to Barak who was trying. Why? Because he refused to lead. He had to, Deborah had to lead. Remember back in chapter 4? Women had to take the forefront. It would seem that today is not a whole lot of difference. Because it seems that more women, to me, dare take a stand for God. And there we have a few good men. But compared to the billions on this earth, Men need to take close record. Verse 31, summing it up. So let all thine enemies perish, O Lord, and they shall. But let them that love him, do you? Do you have blessings or cursings? A answer me. To them that love him be as the sun when he goeth forth in his might. And the land had rest forty years, that time of probation. Well, which is it? Does the sun walk to you and with you? And do, do you have a bright, wonderful day every day in the Lord? Or do you have the cursings of God? Because, you see, God doesn't have to strive a great deal to bring cursings. People bring plenty on themselves when they refuse to wake up and see what time it is and to follow the living God. What are you doing? Have you made a stand? Well, I, I know many of you have, and I thank God for you, but that's not really important. It's the fact that He thanks you for yourself and he loves you very much for caring about his word for allowing him our father to use you as a vessel that makes a difference carrying the sword which is his word oh truth will draw a little blood I, I draw blood occasionally it offends some people and they'll boo-hoo a little bit and I love them, though, and true love is hard love sometimes. As long as it drives you into the Word and a closer walk with your Father, whereby you have blessings rather than cursings, I've served my purpose, and I'm happy for you, and I really love you, or I really wouldn't care. Again, what's most important, He loves you. He loves you even when you're a sinner. Pretty hard for a man to do that. But he does, and he gives you that opportunity to make a difference. What's your life like, friend? I mean, if we took a tally and a muster today, what has this Christian done? 
for his father or her father. Well, let's open the book. Let's check you out. Well, do we have pages here or is there only one line? Was saved on so and so. No entries after that. Was saved but never went to work in the Word of God. I hope that's not you. Unfortunately, that's where the majority are. Been working in the church 20 years and still don't know how to do anything but sit down and be a pew potato. Saved. <laughs> Saved by who, I wonder? We'll find out soon when the false Messiah comes, won't we? How about it? What does the book say about you? It's his book. It's the living word. He wrote the letter to you. Read it. Always choose blessings over cursings. All right. Bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? <laughs> 